All right, here we go. Grant Cardone, welcome back to Vlad TV. Man, so good. I've been missing you, my brother. I've been missing you too, man. I've been missing you too. I was actually supposed to go to Miami to go do the house tour, but I guess that'll happen next time. We'll do it next time. I, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. We'll do the whole crib walk through, the plane walk through, the heli walk through. I'll get you up in the sky. I'll get you to puke on my helicopter. <laughs> right. We also got to do the Malibu house. Okay. You know, I, that's closer to home because I live in LA most of the time. Let's go East Coast to West Coast, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, before we talk about everything else, I want to talk about the lawsuit. Now, this has been hanging over you for two or three years? Three years. Three years. Okay. And from what I understand, it's been dismissed with prejudice. Yeah. Okay. Explain to everyone what with prejudice means. Well, it was, first of all, it's been three years, frivolous lawsuit, $10,000. Uh, we couldn't even get these people to act, like, what do you guys even want? One out of 14,000 investors uh, where I was accused of fraud, misrepresentation, uh, overpromotion, exaggerating returns. Um, uh, I, the media called me a con artist, a pyramid scheme, get rich quick, like la, 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 on and on. Okay. I was found without, with prejudice and without amends, which means they cannot come change the lawsuit. They can't alter the lawsuit. They can't go for another angle on the lawsuit. And for no reason can they bring it back to the court. Same judge, liberal court in California, uh, ruled in my favor, not once, but twice on all claims of misrepresentation, fraud, financial arm. There's like, the judge is like, there's no proof, not a penny of proof of any of these claims. Uh, and Vlad, they went through, you got to understand, like, when this kind of thing happens, I've raised a billion dollars online. The SEC now gets involved. The IRS gets involved. Uh, many, many, uh, lawyers are looking, you know, ambulance chasing vampire, uh, lawyers are looking for their payday. And, uh, they have, they have gone over every video that I've done claiming I use social media to exaggerate and the judge could not find even a morsel of wrongdoing. Well, I went through this. So essentially in 2020, a guy named Luis Pino, he invested uh, $5,000 in two funds. That's you, right. right. And he filed a lawsuit. And what I don't understand is there's a class action lawsuit. Doesn't that usually mean a whole bunch of people? That's what I thought. I thought class action. By the way, one of the paper, one of the newspapers or podcasters said it was a monumental class action lawsuit. And they forget mm. to tell people it was one person. And it was 10 right. grand. It was only 10 grand, which is a crazy small amount of money. At the end of the day, though, why even go through this? If someone is suing you or threatening to sue you for 10 grand, I would just pay him 10 grand and keep it moving because well, engaging a lawyer costs more than 10 grand. Let's not talk about everything else. Engaging a lawyer is more than 10 grand. Well, because it, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, as, soon as, the, as soon as this happened, uh, I got, a, I got the, the something in the mail from a lawyer. It's bro. It's just trying to. It's trying to grab somebody's bag. That's all they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. They found out that I had money, and they're like, "Let's go. Let's go hijack this guy." And they thought that yeah. I would roll over and make an offer. Instead, I called the plaintiff, the young man, and said, "Hey, why? Why are you doing this to me? Do you want your money back? Are you not happy with your investment? I see that you bought like seventeen products for my company: workshops, seminars, events, audio programs, books." He's like, no, Grant, man, I love you. I love the material. I like everything I've learned from you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, why are you doing this? He's like, well, because I'm being told that we, you know, and he didn't, then he just shut up and didn't know what to say. He's like, I'm not supposed to talk to you. Hmm. And I said, look, let me just send you the 10 grand back. You keep your distributions. And this went on for three years. Uh, so why would I do it? Because I didn't do anything wrong and I'm not going to be held hostage. Uh, unfortunately, Vlad, as you know, most people don't have three years of fighting something, much less the resources. Um, it just so happened I, I, I was willing to risk those things to to have a win for the little guy. Well, although other people may think this, as you and I who have been through lawsuits understand that settling doesn't mean admission of guilt. You settle because it's financially no, no. more feasible I didn't to, settle. Just, to, to settle. I mean, am I right, though? I didn't settle, though. 
Yeah, I know you didn't settle, but I'm saying oh. in general, just because oh. you settle does not mean that you're guilty. It just means, hey, I could settle for 10K because it'll cost me 100K in lawyer fees to do Dude. it. So it makes more financial sense for 10K. But I, I, that's yeah. what I'm saying. 90, people 95%. Think, people think if you settle, then, oh, I'm guilty. But that's not actually true. 95% of all federal cases against Americans are settled and there was no foul play, okay? Look at all the J6ers, man, that said, yeah, I, I committed a crime. Yeah, I was violent. Yeah, I, they were forced to do that. This is this has happened to the black and brown community for freaking 75 years. Tap out, okay? You're going to lose your job if you don't. You're going to lose your house if you don't. You're going to lose your car. You're not going to be able to make payments. So people are like, okay, I'll plead guilty. Give me three months or give me a probation or, you know, slap me on the wrist. Uh, I'll say whatever I got to say. This has happened for hundreds of years in this country where innocent people tapped out because they didn't have the time, the energy, and the resources. Well, according to this article that I read, you spent a million dollars or more than a million dollars fighting this? Yeah, I spent a million and fifty-eight thousand dollars. A million and fifty-eight thousand to fight a ten thousand dollar lawsuit. Yeah. Okay, but were they asking for way more than that? Like, were they asking for they, damages? They, they, and- they never said what they were asking for. I said, guys, what okay. do you guys want? So what okay. they what they wanted, Vlad, what they wanted was to drag my name through the press. Somebody wanted to damage my name, my reputation, and my business. That's what somebody wanted to do. And it's not the plaintiff, by the way. I'm not trashing the plaintiff. I'm not talking negatively about the lawyers involved. This is the game online today. Lawyers find somebody that has a lot of a big a big name. Okay. And this doing something. I'm a loud mouth. I know I am. I'm braggadocious. I show off. I know all the things that some people say about me. That makes me a target. And so what they're going to do is the, the, the lawyers first. And again, I'm not speaking about this particular lawyer or the plaintiff when I talk about this. What they do is they drag the internet, not just for this case, but for other cases similar to it. This is basically free advertising by hundreds of different lawyers and law firms, ambulance chasing, uh, how they live with themselves, empty, soulless human beings. Well, in the lawsuit, so so I read through the article, it said the you know, the plaintiffs alleged that Cardone misled investors on social media by allegedly overpromising investor returns, downplaying their financial liability, and not fully disclosing the fees he collected. Cardone also allegedly refused to adjust the sales tactics despite receiving a warning from the Security and Exchange Commission that his promises to investors they would realize returns of 15% did not appear to have any factual basis, the lawsuit alleges. So did you claim a 15% return? Yeah, I still do. Okay, that's a really big return. No, you know, it's not. You're not, not getting not that these in the S&P 500. These, these, these properties should do. I never promised it. Okay? Well, I have, most of my portfolio has done well in excess of 15% per year. Most, okay. of the, most of these properties are doing 6 and 8% per year in cash flow. All I have to do is have a little bit of an exit to even hit a 15. So that's not an overpromise, promise, okay? And I never make a promise. Now, I was asked by one of the alphabet companies to quit making those kind of claims. And I'm like, why? Dude, that's what they're going to do. I'm telling you, that's what the deal is going to do. With any kind of rent increases and appreciation and devaluation of the dollar, I've been doing this for 35 years. Real estate produces this kind of return over and over and over again, particularly when you're extremely disciplined about the location and the asset quality. So that, that's not an overstatement. And the courts, by the way, ruled in my judgment that it wasn't an over-exaggeration. Nice. Okay. And after the lawsuit was dropped, you celebrated by making a video and you started trashing all the media companies that were basically, you know, trash talking you for the past, you know, couple of years. I've been waiting three years to assault them and I'm not done. All the podcasters out there, the YouTubers, the people that have attacked my religion, Okay, why do a real estate article and talk about my religion in the same article? You're talking about Scientology. Yeah, why? Why Why do that? I mean, Scientology has had, you know, a bad rap, you know, in the media for a long time. Uh, but from what I understand, wait a minute, wait I a minute, wait a minute. Hang on a second, hang on a second. Time out. Yeah. So in I'm Catholic. I'm not saying it's a bad religion. I'm just saying it's I'm, got a bad rap in the media. I'm a Catholic and I buy a piece of real estate. Should I include in the article, Grant Cardone buys a $100 million piece of real estate and he's a Catholic? Right. Okay. And by the way, the Catholics have had their fair share of issues with, you know, certain issues. 
<laughs> right. In the 2023, when I can cut my dick off, in fact, and convince my children to do it, okay, to, to confuse people, like, all oh, that's okay to do, but what, 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 it's okay to trash somebody's religion because it's controversial, because it gets a headline, because it's clickbaity, because that's what people remember, that that's how you get viewers. This has to be stopped in this country where people are trolled like that because of their choices, whether it's their sexual choices, their racism, the like, or, or their, their, the color of their skin or the religion they have. That, that clickbait, bold title has to be stopped by these podcasters, YouTubers, and fake media companies. And, and to be fair, and I actually looked through the lawsuit, the search of Scientology is not included in this lawsuit in That's any right. fashion. Zero. Yep. So, so why would now, these, why would these groups, these podcasters, YouTubers, and fake media outlets even have that as part of the article? Well, you trashed a bunch of media companies after the lawsuit was dropped. Was Huffington Post one of the media companies that you trashed? 100%. It's a garbage dump. Okay. It, it's a, a fake news outlet. Article that, on you, that, 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 you know, which is somewhat of a hit piece on you uh, back in June, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hit okay. piece. Yeah, it's a hit piece. And it's fake news. And it's misrepresentation. And it's fraudulent. And it's fake. Okay. And it's a pyramid scheme, by the way. Everything that they said I do, exaggerating realities, that's what they do. These people post stuff. They don't even do any research. I don't know if you saw the video that I interviewed one of the people, uh, the journalist from Real Deal that never presents the real deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, the real deal. I interviewed this guy and recorded the entire call. He doesn't. He, he admits that they don't even do any research. In the Huffington, Huffington Post article, there's a section of it which basically says that there's lawsuits where people get into these $500 or $800 a month uh, contracts with your company and they're saying they can't get out of them. Can you address that? A company gets in a contract with me, agrees to pay me $30,000 over 24 months. Ford Motor Company, uh, Nissan, uh, Toyota says, hey, we're going to pay you a million dollars for a two-year contract. Yeah, they're not getting out of the contract. And that's that. That's that, bro. <laughs> you signed oh, there a 24-month contract. I go, buy a, I go buy a Toyota and finance it for 96 months. They don't let me out of the contract. I don't know. I don't even know what they're talking about. Okay. Okay. So, you so do a subscription with okay, Huffington and, and Post. So they're basically trying to get out of the contract on, by black, suing black. you. You do okay, a subscription, you agree to do a subscription with Huffington Post and you pay $89 and decide after a month you don't want to keep it anymore and you want your $80 back, they're not going to give it back to you. That's true. And again, they're confusing different businesses, by the way. They're trying to trash me as a real estate guy. Then they add the Scientology piece to bring in my religion. And then they go to this other business that I own. I own 11 companies and then want to find some garbage with the 160,000 contracts that I did last year out of my other business where I had 160,000 consumers give me money, but they want to take one person and said, I couldn't get my money back. That's right. You signed a contract, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And they try to kind of uh, paint the person as they had to go into their credit card debt and they can't pay their rent and their bills because of this contract. But you're right. At the end of the day, you sign a contract. You got to fulfill the contract. If I sign a lease, I have to fulfill the lease. Now, when the lease is over, I can leave. Exactly. And, and, and I've always been very transparent about, hey, if I agree to do something with you, I'm going to do it. If you agree to do something with me, I'm going to hold you to it. And these media companies that are trashing me, trust me, Vlad, I just started. I'm going after every one of them. I will spend whatever I have to spend to send a message to them. Number one, don't do this again. Number two, uh, if you do it again, you got, you, your legal team's going to be like, okay, he's coming. And three, I hope to win a bunch of money from this because I was damaged in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. This, uh, these headlines and clickbaiting and claims and false exaggerations and, and complete untruths about me. 
uh, have have damaged my business, my name, my reputation, uh, and, and I I want to be uh, remunerated for that. Well, there you have it, Grant. You know, I've been rocking with you the whole time. Well, my media company has never said anything bad about you. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you would know by now. <laughs> no, you, but you, you know, congratulations you, on winning. On you're winning you're the not lawsuit. on the We're list. Lawsuit dropped. You're not on the list, and Bigger Pockets is not on the list. Bigger Pockets did a fair fair coverage of it, and you've always done fair coverage. But the rest of these scumbag magazines, okay, not only am I going to trash your names, but you're going to pay me something. There you have it. All right, so let's switch gears here. The last time we did an interview uh, was in January of 2021, which was near the start of the pandemic. And a lot of things were kind of going crazy and so forth. And right around that time, I asked for your real estate prediction. And you, you said that COVID is going to destroy the housing market. Housing, single family homes in this country are going to be destroyed. We're going to go from 60, 63% ownership, probably down to 57 or 56. Last weekend, uh, JP Morgan Chase increased the down payment on a single family to 20%. Minimum down payments, 20%. The beacon score or the credit score has to be a 700 to get a mortgage. Housing's over. Yeah. But in fact, the housing market boomed like crazy. Crazy. I mean, I was surprised. Were you surprised? 100%, dude. That, you know, but as I look back over history, every time people get terrified, they go buy homes. Hmm. I don't know what people think the world's coming to an end. Let me go buy a place to live in. While it ends, I can be in my house. Well, I mean, this was somewhat of a special case because everyone started leaving the office and working from home and yeah. they wanted a more comfortable place to live. People were moving out of the cities, having a, you know, getting into houses, getting slightly bigger places and so forth. And actually what's interesting is about a year and a half ago, I actually bought my first house in like 20 years. Uh -huh. You did it, huh? I did it. I did it. And number one, I was fully aware this was not an investment. Yeah. This is the first time in my life that I'm buying a house and I say, I'm buying this house because I afford it. I yeah. can afford it. And I want to live there. You know, and I want my family there. And when I sell it, who cares? That doesn't matter. I'm not even thinking about that. So, you know, you actually taught me that. You were the one that said a single family house is not an investment. If you want to do an investment, get like 30 units. But if you want a, a single family house, do it because you want to do it. Yeah. And, and I did it. And I know, I know it's not, I mean, the property taxes are crazy. Uh, you know, our air conditioning broke. The new air conditioner costs like 5,000. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's definitely a lot of cost, you know, a lot of cost in the association fee in my gated community. But I did it because I could afford it and I liked it. But what I want to say, what was interesting is because you went on a lot. I know I watched the Mike Tyson podcast that you did and you kind of broke down how you know, the banks really make all the money when it comes to these mortgages. Right. Right. And, you know, during the course of a 30 year mortgage, you're going to pay twice, maybe even three times the price of the house during the course of that. Is that accurate? Well, right now you're going to pay 8%. Let's say you have it for 10 years, you're going to pay 80%. So if the home was a mil, let's say the home was 500 grand, 400,000 will be paid in interest to Bank of America. Exactly. And it's going to be front loaded, meaning that you pay it all in the beginning. So if you sell before ten, the 10, ten years, ten, you pay most of the interest. Yeah. First 10 years, you probably paid $330,000 worth of interest. Exactly. So, so, exactly. So that means when you do the calculation of $500,000 house, just with interest, you would have to sell it for, in this case, 900 grand to break even. Now, exactly. that's not property taxes. That would be another 2% times 10 years, 20% of the 500 grand, that'd be another 100 grand because property taxes are going to be in, mo in many states, particularly non-income tax states are going to be closer to 2% than they are 1%. Yeah. Uh, and you haven't maintained the property. You haven't fixed the air condition that you talked about, not to mention you were stuck there for 10 years. Well, the one thing that I think we really did right was for the first time in my life, I didn't get a mortgage. So what I did was I leveraged my company and I got something called a shareholder loan and all my lawyers and my accounts all went through it. So a loan, basically Vlad TV gave me a loan Good. at whatever the, whatever the interest rate was at the time, which was the lowest possible interest rate. So right. it was the best loan I could have possibly gotten and I pay it back to my own company. 
And then the other part that I got was actually something called the LMA loan, you know, because I have a, a sizable uh, stock portfolio. So I figured out that I could take a loan against my stock portfolio without actually selling my stock portfolio, once again, at a much lower rate than a mortgage. And I got these two checks. I paid off you know, the, the old owner and I got the title of the house. And now I live in a house that I own completely, you know, because even even my loan, I technically don't have to pay it back. They'll just keep kind of upping up the loan and they'll, they'll yeah. eventually take the stock portfolio, worst case, but they're not going to take the house. So to have a feeling of no matter what happens, because I'll tell you, back in 2001, I just bought a half million dollar house in the Bay Area and suddenly the, the, the dot com collapsed. My company got wiped out and I had to sell it after eight months. Yeah. And it, and it killed me. It absolutely killed me because I couldn't afford to pay the mortgage. Right. And I'm like, I'm never going to do this again. And to know that I live in a house that no matter what happens, as long as I can pay the property tax, which, which is a lot, but still, as long as I can pay the property tax, I never have to move. No one can kick me out. I have the actual title, not the bank. And I know that every month Man. I'm not paying this huge, you know, interest payment that goes straight to the bank. Man, I want to, when I grow up, I want to be, uh, you know, I want, I want to make moves like you make it. But, you know, I started to realize that most of the people I talk to in my income bracket and above, they all do this. Yeah. Nobody, no multimillionaire goes to Bank of America and gets a mortgage. Yeah. And that's the way to do it right now if you can. You know, unfortunately, most people can't because, you know, they don't have the down payment, much less the whole payment. And uh, the mortgage is 8%. That's going to be double what the rent would be on that place. Probably mm -hmm. two and a half times now. And this is, again, why I'm going to come back full circle to the rental game. This rental game is going to continue to work out for guys like me because, uh, number one, the rental properties that are, that are being built today are phenomenal. I mean, they actually compete or dominate the amenities that a single family home can, can, can provide. Uh, and, and they're cheaper. You know, the average rent's about $1,800 a, a month, uh, across the country and the average mortgage is almost four grand. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because right now, mortgage rates have hit their highest point since 2000. Yeah. So in 23 years, we are at the very highest. So think about all the first time home buyers that are, you know, 25, 30 years old. They've never seen anything like this in their life. So basically, the rate set off a dozen, a dozen different records in two, you know, since 2020, where, where it was at the record lows, you know, and prices because the, you know, the inflation, the, sorry, the mortgage rates were so low back in 2020 the prices of homes rose 40%. And now things are actually shifting and it's creating something called golden handcuffs yes. with potential sellers. So explain to everyone what golden handcuffs are. Well, well, what's happened is about 90% of the loans in America, the mortgages in America, we don't have a mortgage problem on homes today. It's kind of a reverse problem. Now, about 90% of all the mortgages in America are under 4.5%. 50% of them are under uh, uh, 4%, and like 35% of them are under 3%. Full term, 30 years. Yeah. So this is why so many people went and borrowed money on their homes, because the, the, the rate was so low, right? It was like, okay, it's shit, the money's free, basically. Yeah, now, probably, probably a lot of people refinanced during this era also. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, and mm -hmm. so like, I got a buddy, he owns, he owes $4 million on a house at 2.8% for 30 years. Dude, he's never going to pay the house off. It doesn't even make sense for him to sell it. Like the loan could be worth as much money as the house because for somebody to buy that house, they would be at eight points. They would be six points higher than his money. And so he, he's going to be better off. He wants to sell, by the way. I said, don't sell it, dude, rent it. Keep your mortgage yeah. at 2.8, fund, finance it to the next guy. Like just finance it to him at 6%. Saves in two paint points over Bank of America. You basically make 3.2% on $4 million. You're making money on the interest. You're making money on the, the basically what sound looks like a tenant. And, uh, you're not paying taxes except on the, the portion that he pays you back. So if the guy misses a note, you just take it back, keep the down payment and move on down the road. It's almost like a rental uh, where the individuals will become um, banks, basically, and 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 or landlords and not knowingly. They didn't even know they were going to do that. So, well, uh, well, 
because right now mortgage demand for home buyers is at a 28 year low. 28 years. Yeah. So nobody's getting a mortgage right now. So what's that happening on the macro level? So so what happens is if I can't first of all I don't have the 20% down. The price of homes has not come down. I I said it I said the housing when you and I met in 2020 I I said the housing market would not crash. Okay? I I thought that there would be devastation in the marketplace but it wasn't going to be housing. Okay? Because People got to have a place to live, period. And we have a shortage of about 4 million ho- homes in America. And there's probably another 40 million homes in America that nobody actually wants to live in. They're old homes that need to be redone. They're from the 1950s and 60s. And your kids don't want to move into that house because it makes it feel like, feels like your grandmother's house. It's just not desirable. It's not the neighborhood. It's not cool. It's not, it doesn't have so- society around. It might not have, uh, the social aspects are a good location. It's kind of, it's outdated, basically. So you got a shortage of homes, a shortage of inventory. You got a cl- a customer, a mark, a, a guy, an individual that does not qualify for the mortgage. You got prices sitting up here at 500 grand because they were inflated because of all this printing of free money. Some people suggest these homes could actually be more expensive they, than they are right now. Like if you go to other parts of the world, Sydney, Australia, you go to the UK, you go, um, uh, where, where else could you go to Dubai and you're going to be like, shit, housing in America is still pretty cheap. Come down to Miami. Like Miami didn't know. We didn't know we were going to get all these people to come down here to make Ron DeSantis look like a genius. <laughs> I mean, this is the one thing that Ron keeps out of his pitch, right? I mean, he benefited from COVID. Him in Texas, uh, Abbott, benefited from COVID as governors. Period. End of story. Full stop. Yeah, because of the population that moved into those states. They, they had nothing to do with that. They were just like, hey, we're open for business. That was good. Uh, it's because the people down here weren't going to close anyway, and the people in Texas weren't going to close. So they just kind of took a knee to the people. And New York, New Jersey... Uh, Connecticut all flooded down here and said, Hey, I'm going to go live in Miami permanently. And, and what that did was there's no housing stock down here anyway. And all those people came down here. They want to live in new stuff. They're, they're used to big, tall glass buildings, great amenities, good air condition, updated stuff. So they came down here in supposedly inflated things. They didn't actually inflate anything. They brought things back to, in my mind, they brought things to their right value. That Miami, for instance, Miami and Fort Lauderdale or Naples, Florida, the West Coast over there, uh, Fort Myers and Sarasota have just been kind of missed super opportunities, undervalued properties that now everybody in the local feels like they were, they're, they're inflated. But the locals always say that, Vlad. Right. The local people never properly value where they live. It's always an outsider that comes in from California and says, Hey, I'll give you 35 million for your house. And everybody's like, what the hell just happened? Cause he left a place where that house would be 80 million. So it looks yeah. like a steal to him. Well, I mean, the Fed chair basically said that inflation is still too high. And he's basically saying there should be more, you know, there's probably going to be more interest rate increases. Yeah. You know, he's seeing things come down, but not to where it's, it's supposed to be. Now, you and I are old enough to remember how bad things were in the 80s. Yeah. The 80s were a train wreck. And for the longest time, we basically had zero inflation. I mean, zero uh, interest rates, you know, really for, I mean, my God, for like 15 years or something like that. Yep. And now things are getting back to normal. And, you know, like when I see these Hollywood strikes and so forth, I think it's really just based on everything is just so much more expensive now. And people's salaries are not keeping up with how much everything costs now. I've been, I've been telling people this for, I don't know, 15 years. You need to make more money. Right. People need to make more money. Everything's inflated on you, but your imagination. <laughs> the American people are fucking dumb, bro. The middle class is a bunch of robots walking around hypnotized because they have two cars and a college degree 
And because you're not in jail or you're no threat of jail, you think you're good. You, you don't live in inner city Baltimore. You're not struggling for food every day. So you think you're safe. You're not safe. And this is what all these groups of people are being finally hit with. Okay. Uh, uh, you're like, you're making 250 grand a year and you have no money left over. I've been saying this for years. There was a video I did about if you make 400 grand working for an insurance company where you can make $4 million, you should be ashamed of yourself as a father and a husband. And I got trashed over this. Okay. I'm like, look, if the guy next to you is making $4 million in the same company where you sell the same product, had the same opportunity and you make 400 grand and you feel good about yourself, you should be ashamed of yourself. And then that went over the internet and it's like, uh, oh, Grant Cardone thinks you got to make 400 grand to make, feel good about yourself. Hey, you need to make 400 grand just so you can fucking get ahead in this country. Period. And, and yeah. that's the truth. And the politicians aren't going to tell you that. Joe and his buddies are going to tell you, oh, everybody need, you deserve a raise. The people at Ford Motor Company should be making more money. Okay. But, but they're never going to tell you the middle class is broken. They're going to never tell you the system is broken. They're never going to tell you that Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan are the masters of the universe and you're their slave. No, absolutely. You talked about this on the Tyson podcast, and, and this makes perfect sense. I've always known this. Every dollar you put into your bank account, into your checking or your savings, they're turning around taking that money and investing it right away. The bank. They're sending it to me so I can invest it. Right. You know, to you, to whoever else. But they're not keeping it. Matter of fact, they, they don't have to keep even it. keep. If, if let's just say all the, the Bank of America customers had, let's say, $100 billion in their accounts. Bank of America doesn't have to keep that $100 billion there for them to take it out. They only have to store a percentage because they know that everyone's not going to do a run on the bank. Everyone's not going to show up one That's day right. and want to have, you know, take all their money out. But so they only have to keep, I don't know what it is. Is it 30% or 20% or it's a relatively low amount? Yeah, it's a very low amount, but they, they need to keep 10%, I think, of the reserves. I can look it up, but, but they can also loan that money out 10 times and not drop the value of the, the debt value. Like they gave me a $15 million loan against a $15 million piece of property. They don't have to drop the value of that asset on their books ever. Mm. That happened right after SVB, by the way. They changed all the laws and said that they can keep their treasury bills, for instance. If they have $10 billion of treasury bills that were at 2% and now blew up to 5 the value of those treasury bills today are probably only 60% of what they had them on their books for. Those banks do not have to mark that down today. Every bank in this country, I, I, I'm not going to say every bank, there's three to 400 banks waiting to roll over in America right now. Well, you're actually right. And, it's only 10%. and let me just finish this, Vlad. Your boy, Jerome Powell, okay? Yeah. He is one of the worst human beings living today for the American dream, okay? <laughs> he will create okay. more renters he will create more renters in this country. He will destroy the middle class. He is an extension of Anthony Fauci, okay? Where Anthony could no longer sell the, the vaccine, they put Jerome Powell in to sell this illusion of, I have to control inflation, okay? Last thing I want to say on this, inflation is impossible to control. It, the raising of interest rates have never in history, ever, controlled inflation, including Volcker, Paul Volcker. Was it Paul Volcker or Jim Volcker? What was the cat's name? Yeah, Paul Volcker. It took 10 years for interest rates to come down. I'm sorry, for inflation to come down in the 80s. He caused two major recessions when you and I were growing up. Two major recessions. Okay. Uh, and it took 10 years for inflation to get under control. They give him credit for doing that. Powell, Powell gives Volcker. Powell's like Volcker's. I think he's been on Volcker's dick for his whole life. Okay. I want to be the next Volcker. I want to be known for controlling inflation. Nobody, the Federal Reserve cannot control inflation. It's bullshit. Well, you're actually right. Uh, I looked it up. Banks only have to hold 10% of your money in reserve. So that means for every $1,000 you put in your bank account, that bank could take 900 and flip it. And they can flip it 10 times. 
They can loan it to 10 different parties, the full 900, 10 times. That's, that's kind of wild. And they don't tell you this, by the way, they don't tell you banks are the riskiest business in America today. There is no, no institution that is riskier than a bank for that very reason. Okay. Mm. They take their liabilities and they call them assets and they call their assets liabilities. They're, they're, the banking, the banking balance sheet is actually reverse of yours. It's a mirror of the individual. So my mm. cash is an asset. When I give them cash, it's a liability. My debt is a liability. Their debts are assets. So explain to me what happened with the whole Silicon Valley bank, uh, situation because, you know, because that affected me as well. I mean, I have companies right now that still owe me money because they were banking with Silicon Valley Bank and they had clients that were banking with Silicon Valley Bank and it created a real clusterfuck of a situation. Well, what exactly happened from your point of view? Well, the bank failed, right? So bank banks fail. Uh, uh, Credit Suisse failed. Nobody even talks about this. This happened in the last 18 months. This is the largest bank failure in the history of the United States of America. But But we just move on to it like it's nothing because what do we do? We go to Ukraine. So nobody remembers it. Can't sell Ukraine. So guess what happens uh, uh, on on October the fifth? I think it was. You know, Is- Israel gets uh, gets invaded. Okay, these are all cover ups, dude, of other things. Okay, they're hide. This is called hide the weenie. Okay, <laughs> w- banks wars are the friends of banks. Okay, mm. we have a banking problem in America. We have hundreds of banks that are at threat, at risk right now, like SVB and Credit Suisse. We have banks that are booking their, 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 their assets at values that do not exist. And, uh, you have, you have people that are worried. Nobody likes to hear this. This is why I don't keep money in banks. I only use a bank as a facility to hold money until I can get it into a real estate asset. I want that real estate asset to be my bank. Mm. And this cycle is going to create the biggest real estate opportunity in my lifetime. It's going to happen right now in the next 24 months. This rental property thing is going to explode in this country because people will not trust banks. We have the American consumer has more credit card debt than they've ever had in the last 25 years at the Mm -hmm. highest rates. Some of these rates are 25 and 28% freaking insane. We have the highest... We have the highest college debt we've ever had at $1.7 trillion or something. We have, uh, we have, uh, used car, used car valuations going down, inventories in car dealerships going down, and we have delinquencies on cars starting to slow down. The mortgage applications that you mentioned, 28 year lows. Yeah. Rents are starting to flatten out. Yet Jerome Powell or, or or go down in certain areas. So, for example, where I used to live, Oakland had like the biggest drop in a major city in terms of rental uh, rental fees. Yeah. Than, than like in decades. Yeah. It's crazy right now. Yeah. And they will come down. They'll con- con- continue to come down. My portfolio will flatten out and maybe come down. They're going to come down for 24. They're going to come down probably for 25. And then in 26, 27 and 28, they will explode. Well, let's talk about Airbnb. Because right. disaster. that was something disaster. that was something that came in that sort of, you know, it made people think that they could turn their property into actual functioning businesses. But right now, supply is actually outpacing demand and everyone's having to sell their Airbnbs because they can't support whatever mortgage or underlying cost of these Airbnbs. Me personally, I hate Airbnb. I've never had a good experience in an Airbnb. If I travel, I go to a hotel. That's it. You know, I, I mean, like, for example, there's a really famous rapper, you know, named Pop Smoke that some years ago, he decided to stay, stay in an Airbnb and he was like flashing, you know, some of his jewelry and stuff like that. But your guy showed up to try to rob him and end up killing him wow. at the Airbnb. And, and I used to always say that if he was staying, you know, four at the SLS hotel, yeah. he would be alive yeah. right now. And I spoke to him like a week before he died. Yeah. So I'm like, yo, I hate Airbnbs. Just yeah. the concept of them, I hate them. Yeah. Well, so look, what's what's happening with the Airbnbs from your perspective? I like using Airbnbs when I travel. You're just staying at the wrong Airbnbs and you're not carrying any security with you. But um, I mean, I've used some great homes around the world. Now, I've always said that being an Airbnb real estate investor would turn out to be a disaster 
once the locals in Atlanta and New York and Colorado and California came up and said, hey, you can't do short term rentals. OK, I said two, three years ago, this will be outlawed by every city in America that has big hotel presence. Yeah, I think in Brooklyn right now, they passed a law that's saying you could only Airbnb for 30 days or higher. And there can only be two people there and you have to be there with them while they do it. Who wants to do that shit? Right. You, you destroyed the business. That's an orgy. OK, that's not a business. <laughs> So do you think the Airbnb will, I mean, they overbuilt for it. Nashville, Ten Nashville, Tennessee will be a disaster of Airbnb. Okay. It will go down in history as an epic failure where too many people went and built Airbnb, short-term rentals, thinking this is going to last forever. This is a short-term mindset. Real estate has never been a short-term game. Don't try to turn long-term wealth creation into a get rich quick scheme. It will always blow up in your face. Okay. I've never done one. I could have, I could have blown up my returns by doing this. Why do it, dude? It ain't going to last. And it didn't, and it won't. You know, people don't understand the difference between gambling and investing. If you're trying to jump in something and, and jump back out, you're just gambling. You might as well just go to the casino. Investing means you buy something and you plan on never selling it. I've got Google stock from 2010 that yes. I haven't touched. You know, I mean, and I don't have any plans on touching it. Uh, you know, this house that I own, I don't, I don't plan on ever selling it. But for example, I just went to Atlanta, my friend Boosie's house. He lives on an 88 acre property that he's never going to sell. He's built seven homes on it at this point. He has kids, there's streets named after his kids. And it's just amazing to see someone say, I know this is not something I'm going to flip. I know this is not something I'm going to I'm going to churn around and sell. This is something I'm going to hold on forever. And it's multi-generational wealth. And you know, listen, I I'm I'm now a property owner as well, but I understand that for any investment, if you don't plan on staying in it for at least 10 years, just don't even bother. Yeah, but I mean, look, let's let's just be clear and you said this earlier. Your home is not an investment. So I don't want the viewer to say, oh, I'm buying a house. I'm going to stay in it in 10 years. Your home is not an investment, guys. Yeah. You, you, it's a place to live, okay? It's a place Especially to live. Especially if you have a mortgage. It, it doesn't matter. Even if you don't have a mortgage, dude. I, the fact that you don't have a mortgage, it doesn't matter. I bought that house well, in right. Malibu. No, no, no. Still not investment because it could fluctuate. It could go down a million dollars no, next got, year and there's nothing I could do about it. I paid $40 million for that house in Malibu. Mm. I wrote a check for it. I could be earning five and a half percent on that money today. So it's costing me two and a half million dollars a year not to have that money. Oh, yeah. No, you could put it like, for example, uh, Apple has a, a yeah. savings account. Yeah. That you could get five percent guaranteed from yeah. Apple. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's all I'm well, saying. There's there's no free lunch here, right? If you buy a house, then you got to paint the walls. Then you got to have your attention fixed on it. If you can go out and make a couple hundred grand or 400 grand or a million dollars a year, what are you doing fucking cutting your yard on the weekends? Oh, I got to live someplace. The family's got to live someplace. Your kids don't give a shit where they live, okay? Yeah, you could rent. Okay, are you, is your family any happier? Yes, my family's happier. Uh, happier than what? Than when we were renting. Are you having more sex than you used to have? <laughs> About the same. Exactly. Nothing changed, man. <laughs> you just live in a different place, okay? Now, it, but, yeah. And you, you're cool. You're good with it. You know where you're staying. Your, your career's in place. But a lot of these kids coming up, I'm like, what are you doing, man, getting fixed in one place? You should be an adventurer right now. You should be taking risks. You should be following money and opportunity, not getting located on 20th Street. I'm 50, so I look yeah. at it a little bit you're differently. You're an old man, you know I'm I hope when I, I look was, as good as you when I'm your age. I wasn't looking at property. Yeah. I said, I hope I look as good as you when I'm your age. Well, you know, this is actually uh, going to be one of my questions. When I Googled you, I found out you were 65. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm 65. 65. Yo, you look spectacular for 65. Thank Let you. me just say that. Thank you. Appreciate it. What's the secret? The secret is, man, look, fight. You got to fight for life. You got to fight for the life you want. Uh, you got to fight for your family. You got to fight and defend. And you got to win. You can't just fight. And lose, because then you're going to get your ass whooped all the time and you're going to look bad. You got to fight and win. Like winning this lawsuit, man, that makes me feel good, right? It, it, it invigorates me.
Now, fighting these media companies and saying, stop doing this. Stop dragging my name. I think that it's underrated. We don't talk enough about the power of winning. You know, get yourself and your family in a position where you can win and you're going to feel better. This is why this well, is why Jay-Z says, man, I've never seen an ugly billionaire. OK, you know why? Because he's winning. <laughs> OK, well, look, I understand the whole thing of having your mental health and being motivated. But ultimately, you have this body that you have to live in. Yeah. And I mean, look, I, I have a close friend. We're almost the same age. I met up with him. I hadn't seen him in like 15 years. Half of his teeth are gone. Yeah. You know, I mean, he literally pulled out his teeth at lunch. You know, he's he's extremely overweight. Um, yeah. You know, and we started out at almost the same place. And, you know, I look drastically different than him at the same age. Yeah. I lost a lot of weight during the pandemic. I, I, I hit the treadmill every morning for an hour and a half. I just interviewed this guy named Brian Johnson. He was uh, almost a billionaire. He, he sold, um, uh, not Cash App. I forgot what, what company he sold. Uh, let me just... It don't matter, man. Shit. Venmo. Okay. So, yeah. So, he basically owned Venmo and he sold it. Okay. He spends a million dollars a year on his health. Yeah. He he basically created a diet that was, he has like a team of 10 doctors, a specified diet he eats exactly every day. He goes to these various skin treatments and other types of treatments. He He's basically trying to age backwards. I mean, yeah. that's not possible, but you can slow it down. So, do you work out, eat? Doctors, supplements, is there any of that? I, I work out every day. I get uh, eight hours of sleep every night. Uh, I watch the the stuff I eat. I do not eat the foods that I grew up on. Uh, I actually study what I'm putting in my body. Uh, I'm, on a, I'm on a fairly disciplined supplement routine. Okay. Uh, uh, I actually bought a company called 10X Health. We, we, we changed the name of it to 10X Health. I use all the supplements. I use a red light therapy bed every day. Uh, what, what, what is that? The red light therapy bed. It's a red light therapy. I lay in it every day for 20 minutes and it, it's got six beams of light, five of which are invisible that penetrate every bone and marrow and cell in my body. Okay. And you notice the difference by doing that? 100% changes the, the tone of my skin, the tightness of my skin. Uh, not to mention every organ in my body is being penetrated with red light. Um, and, 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 and the most important lights, which you can't even see to the human eye. So there's technology today that exists. Now, unfortunately, most people can't afford all that stuff. But you guys that don't have a million dollars to spend on your health care and your skin care, you're spending tens of thousands of dollars killing yourself. The first thing to do is to like go to your closet, your cabinet, your refrigerator, and look at the shit you're eating. Most of the foods that Americans eat every day and are feeding your kids, they're not even allowed in other, other countries. Mm. Like you go to France or Japan, you take some of our candies. Dude, you can't. Like there's so many warnings on that candy there that aren't on the warnings here. The dyes, the colors, uh, the ingredients, the folic acids. Like it's crazy. So first thing you got to do is quit spending money on shit. Two... Anybody can add a walk. It doesn't cost any money to walk. It doesn't cost any money to wake up early. It doesn't cost any money to take your shoes off and walk in the, in the grass, uh, to go for a walk in the park, to use your bicycle. Just get up and do some shit. You don't have to spend money to take care of yourself, but you got to make a commitment first. Otherwise, you're just going to be obese. Like We have the highest obesity on planet Earth in America. We have the highest, uh, highest uh, prescribed audience of people in the world. We use more prescription drugs on, in America with 330 million people than all the other countries combined. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, I so always that's ask why this your question. buddy's teeth are falling out, bro. What's that? That's why your buddy's teeth are falling out. Well, he also had a drug problem. Let's not. You there you know, go. Cocaine is also hell of a drug. Crack, let's, let's not talk about that I was going to say he had a drug problem, but. <laughs> he, had a, he had a drug problem. You know something? You talked about your drug issues on, on the Tyson uh, podcast. Yeah. So you were selling drugs for about 10 years? No, I wasn't selling drugs. You were taking drugs? Yeah, I was taking drugs for from 15 to 25. 
Okay, were you selling it all or no? No. I mean, I'm, I, I'm passing them on. Me and my buddies are passing them back and forth to each other like anybody does if you're using drugs for 10 years. But I wasn't, okay. like, I wasn't like Pablo Escobar. Okay. What was the worst drug that you took during that time? I do whatever drug you had, bro. Okay. You were, you were, what do they call it? Like a, like a garbage pail drug, drug user? Or whatever you just take drug. Everything? I didn't have a drug of choice. I used whatever drug you had. I never used heroin. I never used X. Um, but whatever drug you had, I used. I was a, okay. I would say I was a degenerate, uh, useless, bottom of the bucket drug addict. Well, you said there was a situation where you got a bunch of stitches in your head. Yeah. But what happened? I had, uh, I had, I was 23 years old. A guy came over to give me some drugs, sell me some drugs. And as I walked him out of the house, uh, they came in, he came in with a buddy, uh, put, hit me with a 45 caliber pistol right here, just poked the barrel in my face and, uh, broke open the front of my face. And then uh, put 70 stitches on the top of my head, uh, reduced both my arms so I couldn't fight back, and um, left me on the left me uh, in the on the floor and robbed my house. Of of the okay. drugs that they just sold to me, they knew I had some money, so they took the drugs, took the money, took a whole bunch of other stuff out of the house, and I spent the next three days in a hospital. Yeah, and since it was. A drug deal in a way you couldn't just go to the police and tell them what happened oh no the police the police showed up because they knew what had happened i mean you, the, the hospital calls right away i didn't call i couldn't call anybody my mom didn't even recognize me hmm. okay and you actually lost some friends during that time yeah how many friends got killed during that era uh three friends okay and how'd they die uh they were shot over drug deals yeah Okay. Two two of them died while I was in a treatment center. Right, because you went to treatment at twenty five. Yeah, so I was I was very lucky, dude. Like I shouldn't even be alive. People, I tell people, man, I came up from the mud and I've been in the streets, and people are like, nah, man, you're a white guy, you got made, you're rich. The, the people don't even understand what I've seen. Did the treatment center really fix you permanently? Because a lot of times you go to rehab and. Drug dealers actually go to rehab to get new clients. 100%. Yeah. So did that rehab actually fix you permanently? No. No. The, the okay. rehab center gave me 28 days to get away from the drug thing. And the drug dealer that's in the rehab centers today is not Danny, the drug dealer. It's Big Pharma. You know, because they're going to they gonna get you off of one drug and put you back on the other. They did that, they did that to me 40 years ago. I was 25 years old. They put me on a drug called uh, phenobarbital, a little white pill. Uh, and, and that's what they had me on there to handle withdrawals, supposedly. So I, they're like, you can't use Valium. You can't use all your benzos and you can't use all the other drugs, the drugs you were abusing, the quaaludes and the methadones and all the other garbage that you could buy in the streets. But you can use our little pill because it's, you know, prescribed. I went back, I, I left the treatment center, threw the stuff in the toilet, never used it again. I've been 40 years of clean off of, off of substances. I love it. Congratulations. Yeah, thank I you. Have drug, I have drug addicts in my family and it's, it's a disaster. Dude, it's brutal, it's a, man. It kills everybody, yeah. by the way. Almost nobody escapes that problem. Yeah, except, uh, you know, one of my guests, uh, Boosie, he always likes to say for everyone, uh, all the drug addicts out there, Leave the fentanyl alone and go back to crack. Crack will keep you living longer. Yeah. Fentanyl will kill you right away. But yeah. you see, you never see a crackhead with cancer. Yeah. You know, they live forever. I'm promoting it. You're promoting Fuck crack. that. <laughs> fentanyl killing all the junkets who've been junkets. I'm talking, it's killing the junkets who've been junkets for forever. Yes. Soon as they hit it, they dead. Right. Crackhead, this nigga shoot threes. This nigga shoot basketball. This nigga, this nigga run, run a hundred miles. This nigga get sane. This nigga fix your car motor. Been doing this for 20 years. This motherfucker still running around the neighborhood. When have you ever heard crackheads hitting the pipe and dying the first time? Never. Never. This spitting all shit is different. I would much rather crack. I'm joking. Well, no, I know you are. Okay, so 
right now you have one plane, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Worth about 53 million? Uh, I don't know what that plane's worth. The 650? I don't I have no idea. Okay, you have two helicopters. I have one helicopter. I sold one. Why did you have two helicopters? Uh because I got a good deal on it. I bought a, I bought it from uh one of the big farmers. Uh they had three helicopters, sold one. There was two there. I wanted to buy one. I made an offer. They took it. And then it was the end of the year. Uh, and I said, hey, guys, if you don't sell the other one, here's my offer. And they accepted it. I then sold that, picked up, made $1.4 million on the sale of a helicopter after I customized it and fixed it up. And uh, But I used the helicopter a lot. Okay. How much is your helicopter worth around? That, that helicopter's got to be worth today probably $8 million bucks. $8 million bucks. Yeah. Okay. The plane's worth... The plane, uh, the, that 650 is probably worth 50, may, maybe $60 million. I mean, I mean, it's okay. not for sale, so it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. How much does it cost in terms of gas prices to move around in a helicopter? Like if you want to take a, a helicopter from, I don't know, from Miami to Fort Lauderdale, how much would it cost you? I have no clue. No, you don't, you don't care. <laughs> no, because first of all, you would not figure like a buddy of mine, he's like, Hey man, what's the fuel cost in your six fifth? I said, bro, I, I don't calculate the fuel cost. He's like, why not? He's worth $4 billion, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I said, he's like, why, why? He, and, he, and he respects me as a businessman. He's like, well, he, he knows I'm not frivolous and I don't care. He's like, well, why don't you know what it costs? I said, because the plane doesn't work without the fuel. Mm. So yeah. he's like, he's like, I like that, dude. I like that. Okay. So part some, of it. some things exactly. you can't, it's like you got, you got a toilet in your office, right? You don't figure the cost of it, dude. You got to have it. You need it. Right. So anyway, I think it costs that, that helicopter probably cost a year is a better, probably cost 500 grand a year to run that helicopter. Okay. Okay. So like the price of a Rolls Royce Phantom basically, but you could fly in the sky. Yeah, but I mean, you got to buy the helicopter. You got to buy the helicopter. I'm saying, well, and you got every you got year two you got to spend the equivalent of a Rolls Royce Phantom yeah, in order to but keep you it got, going. And you got two pilots. Yeah, and you got maintenance and brakes, and that's if everything goes right. Now, the the Gulfstream probably costs three and a half million uh, to keep on the ground. Okay, and do you ever rent it out to like a net chest or anything else like that? Never, never, never. I love, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I know this one rapper named Young Blue who just bought a used plane, but he's planning on renting it out to, to yeah. kind of make the money back. I'm not a big fan of that. Like, you know, I have an apartment in New York that's empty most of the time, but I wouldn't even think to Airbnb it or rent it out or whatever. I just feel like if I can't afford to keep it, I should just get rid of it. Yeah. You know, this whole thing of trying to keep your various, you know, items by renting it out and everything, I always thought was sort of a silly idea. You know, either you can afford it or you can't afford it. The end. Yeah. No, I mean, I could probably pick up if I rented that thing out for it, it'd probably bring 9,000 bucks an hour, maybe 10,000 bucks an hour. So a five hour trip, I could probably pick up what 50 grand one way. Well, you're forgetting a very important uh, stream of income. The, the social media influencers that will actually pay to take pictures in your plane while it's parked to yeah. pretend like they're flying private. Yeah. 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 Th that's a real business, you know. I didn't know that. No, no, that's a real thing. When you see all these Instagram girls flying private, a lot of times the plane is on the ground. Oh, my and they're God. They're paying they're paying the company, the plane company, to go in there and use it for an hour and just do a photo shoot. Dude, I don't like having other people on my plane. Yeah. I feel you. <laughs> Shit. I mean, that plane, that, that 650 of seat, uh, what is it, 17, 16? Mm. Anyway, but it's, it's best when it's just me in the back. Right. It's perfect for oh. one person. Okay, and then you have the Malibu house that's worth forty million. Oh no, that Malibu house has got to be worth eighty million bucks. Okay, so you got the eighty million dollar Malibu, Malibu yeah. house. Yeah, and then you have the house in Florida that's worth how much? Thirty? Forty? Probably forty million. Forty million. Is that your personal real estate portfolio? Those two houses? Yeah, nobody else owns them. Okay. No, I'm saying you don't have properties in let's you know let's say North Carolina or no, overseas no. or anything else like that. No. Okay. Okay. Now, 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 six thousand of the twelve thousand units are mostly mine. Ninety, right. ninety-four percent of that portfolio. The first, the first twenty years, I was buying real estate. 
I bought it for me, my brother, and my sister. And there was no other investors. Okay. So if you look at your total net worth. Yeah. One article. Oh, you're trying to that figure that recently, out. You're trying to figure out what the net worth is. I'm trying to figure it out. It's the, this one article said four billion. Is that accurate? No, I'm not worth four billion. More or less. No, uh, less, less, definitely less than four billion. How much do you think? Uh, well, dude, it's very net worth is a very. Uh, First of all, it's an ego thing only. Okay, it's, it has nothing to do with reality. Uh, net worth is it, it, it has no reality really. You can't spend it, can't use it. I just want everybody to understand that. Okay, how it's calculated is based on your assets, your cash accounts, um, the value of your companies, your accounts receivables, uh, your goodwill. Um, there, there's so many things to go into it. Like we have the companies here, which a lot of people don't, they don't understand my privately held companies. There's 11 companies. They're probably worth three or $4 billion by themselves. If I wanted to take them to the marketplace, borrow money against them, leverage them, IPO them, they're probably conservatively, we'll do this year, we'll do $650 million in gross revenue out of this little operation. Uh, 300 of that is from the real estate. And the other 350 is from this, these privately held companies. Those are probably worth a good three or four billion dollars. The real estate portfolio is worth four point, it's got to be four point five billion dollars right now and growing with only two billion dollars worth of debt. Hmm. So if you do the math and all that, right, there's two and a half billion dollars in the real estate. There's three or four billion dollars in the privately held companies. That's no debt on those at all. Uh, there's probably a couple hundred million dollars in cash. I tell everybody this. I'm not bragging when I tell people this. I'm telling people this because fuck the IRS knows, the SEC knows. <laughs> like, like everybody else knows. I don't know why I can't tell people. You know, in business, these are my, these are my Super Bowl rings. Mm. Okay. If Tom Brady's like, look at my rings, look at my rings. Nobody's like, oh, wrong on him. Kanye does a platinum record. He's like, look at my record. Like in business, these are my rings, right? I have done business for 35 years. I've only had three lawsuits. I've won every one of them. I've had four audits by the IRS, won every one of them. These are my rings, right? My helicopter, the plane, the businesses, uh, the net worth. These are, this, this is proof that, that one, I'm a good guy. I think that that means that I'm a good guy, by the way. Okay. Because I'm not fucking people over. And a good guy is not, I like you. A good guy is, dude, do you fuck people over? Because I could like you and you could still be fucking a bunch of people over. I got a bunch of people around me doing well. I got 700 employees. Uh, I got a kid back there, 24 years old, black kid, 24 years old, just got out of school. He's going to make 550 grand this year. See, that's one of my trophies. That's, that's, that's a, that's a ring for me, right? That's, mm. That's success. And, and, and it's not just about me and my money and my net worth, but my net worth today has got to be, I don't know, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a bricky. It's a lot. It's a lot. Well, since our last interview, I interviewed uh, Robert Kiyosaki who wrote Rich Dad. Yeah, Poor Robert Dad. really likes me. Well, he said he doesn't agree with your financial advice. And he said, I don't put much word worth in Grant Cardone's words. Yeah. Why, why do you guys have this kind of disagreement? Do you know, do you, I think Robert said in the interview with you, he's like, I've gone toe to toe with Cardone many times. You know, and Grant, he and I have gone, gone head to head with each other. So just to know that, so I don't have much, uh, I don't put much worth in his words. The next time you meet him, ask him, how many times has he even met me in person? How many times has he met you? Zero. Have you guys done an interview or anything? I or? did one podcast with him. He's never been toe to toe with me. That was a lie. At best, it was an exaggeration, but it's false. It was completely not true. He's never met me. He's never gone toe to toe with me. And I've spent maybe 12 minutes with him in an interview. Okay. So I don't, I don't know what, what he knows about my business. I don't know what he knows about my advice. I don't know why he would disagree with anything when we haven't even spent any time together. Well, I know this. Robert, I know this. You know. Go ahead. Uh, 
you know, maybe, maybe he should do more of what he says and, 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 and you know, more of what he says, just do more of what you say, dude. Why, why don't you own $4 billion worth of real estate? Well, what Robert said, which was very different than what anything I've ever encountered, was that he doesn't keep his money in cash. He keeps it in gold, like actual physical gold. And apparently, and I guess it's overseas as well, that he has these big vaults just filled with gold bricks. Yeah. And um, did Robert I've tell you? Heard, I've never hey, heard did of Robert doing tell this. you who wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad? What's that? Did Robert tell you who wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad? He didn't write it. Might be like his gold. Okay. You ain't seen the gold. You ain't seen proof of the gold. You ain't seen the vault. Now, when I tell you I own 12,000 units, I can give you an address on all 37 properties. It's public record. So I'm just saying, man, show me, don't tell me. Well, he does have a best-selling book that continue to sell decade after decade. 100%. And other books and everything else like that. 100%. Do you know who owns good, the book? Yeah, you know who owns book. the book? Who's that? You know who wrote the book? Uh, you're telling me he didn't write the book. Do I you know? He wrote do you book. know who the rich dad and the poor dad even were? Uh, I did ask him about that, and I, I said that there was a rumor that this whole concept was made up, and he said it wasn't. A lot of people question whether this person actually existed, the rich dad, right? Because there's lots of references to him. I, I watched some interviews. You said that he owned a ton of land in Hawaii. I guess the the land that they built the Hilton on in uh, in Honolulu and so forth. Um, so did that person actually exist, or was is this just a concept you came up with for the book? No, I mean, I told you the story. I got court martialed for lying. Hmm. This this is in seventy three or four. And so they really did, did exist a rich dad and a poor dad. Okay. And and the and I went to ask my rich dad, I said, would you mind speaking out for me? And the family said, no. And I want you to know something, Vlad. The rich don't tell people what they know. It was? He said it wasn't, he, but he wouldn't give the name of the person. But he won't give the, 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 the name of the rich dad or the poor dad. Well, the poor dad is his own dad. Okay, so who's the rich dad? He wouldn't say. <laughs> some rich dad, poor dad, sometimes dad lied. Okay. What are your thoughts on Dave Ramsey? Oh, Dave's good, man. Dave's great, you know. Dave's great, great guy. Very conservative. You know, he's trying to get people out of debt. There's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. Dave's advice. Yeah, I mean, his thing was to get rid of all your debt first. Dave which, wants to keep I people mean, out I, of I've debt, always right? I think that's good, man. People use credit cards too much in this country. They, they buy homes they shouldn't be buying. They, they, they buy cars they shouldn't buy. They, they borrow money for Gucci belts and try to, try to pretend to be somebody they're not. That's where that ends though. Now, once you, once you understand that, by the way, I don't think most Americans suffer from that. Most Americans suffer from saving money too much. Most Americans suffer because they're too conservative and they don't take enough risk. And so for those that want to get wealthy, at some point you're going to leave Dave's advice and you're going to start watching what wealthy people do. Right. But I think getting rid of debt first before doing that is a good idea. Because you're paying like 25% on credit cards, which is Dude, insane. Dude, I've never paid a credit card one penny in my entire no. 65 years on this planet. Visa, MasterCard, American Express have never earned one penny of my money. So- Oh, yeah. I'm not oh, talking yeah. I mean, to that group of people. If you're an idiot, go listen to Dave. Right. I mean, me personally, I never even used credit cards up until my mid-30s. Yeah. I always used debit cards. And it wasn't until someone told me, hey, you know, if you use a credit card, like an airline credit card or American Express, you can earn points from, you know, on yeah, but, flights. Yeah. But and that, I'm like, oh, okay, great. Let me start using credit cards and just auto pay it at the end of every month. Yeah. So I've never paid any interest, but then I've gotten, there you, go. you know, when I flew, when I, when my family flew to Dubai, we flew for free. Yeah. You know, business class on yeah. Emirates. Yeah. Using points. Yeah. And, and I'm that's with the only you. That's the only reason for me to use credit cards. And I use credit cards. I didn't say I didn't use credit cards. I use the credit card. I just don't pay the interest because I pay them in full every 30 days. Me too. And, and so I think Dave's great for, for most people that just want to figure out how to get out of debt. You know, like he's done a great job. He's a great 
uh, uh, he, he, he does a great job on TV, but I'm not going to take Dave's advice to, to build a real estate portfolio because you need to use debt to build a, if you want to build a $4 billion real estate portfolio, you're going to have to use debt. Yeah. Well, the debt you're talking about is not the debt that he's talking about. That's right. 100%. Yeah. So you got that. You got, I, I, okay, me and Robert, me and Robert, you're trying to create some controversy. Me and Dave. No, I'm, not, I'm not trying to create controversy. I interviewed yeah. him. I didn't know what his answer was going to be. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't know what y'all's relationship is. I brought you up and he said what he said. I, so I mean, I'm bringing it to you. Yeah, I'm just telling you, next time you meet with him, hey, man, why are you saying you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Grant when you never even met him? Right. Like, why, why even say that? And then you can move into the gold vault. Okay. And then you can move into the old, uh, uh, to rich dad. Yep. Why, why, why isn't there no name? Do you have any significant amount of money in Bitcoin or crypto right now? A little bit. Just a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. What's, what's a little, you know, tiny it piece. Is, do you have 1% of your wealth in, in crypto? Uh, that would be, uh, how much would that be? $10 million? A lot. 10 million? Something like that. Yeah, no. Uh, no uh, exactly. uh, yeah, actually, actually, probably close to that, actually. Okay, so 1%. So you're putting a little bit. So this no, is no, that's not how it happened. Actually, somebody gave me, uh, they gave me uh, 100 pieces uh, for a speaking gig when the, when the Bitcoin was 500 bucks. Wow. Okay. And I so took you just it. Got you just got lucky, basically. You just I, I did get lucky. Then I yeah. bought. Then I bought. I'm just going to be transparent. I bought another million dollars at thirty grand. So mm -hmm. I bought another thirty pieces when it was at thirty thousand, which I'm underwater on. Right. Um. And you know, if it breached, if it breached eighteen again, I'd I'd load up. Right. It's at twenty eight four hundred right now. Yeah. So, so it's slightly slightly underwater. More still, or less, I'm breaking. still negative. I'm still negative, if I'm being honest, right? Okay. Now, your conferences, the, the the level of celebrity that you bring to your conference is kind of mind blowing. Thank you. So let's talk about some of the bigger guests you've had on there. Okay. Let's start with the probably the biggest celebrity you've had on there, Donald Trump. Okay. How did that come together? Uh, I was at, actually, I got invited to his country club. A uh, partner of mine, Brandon Dawson, said, hey, you want to go play uh, golf with Donald Trump? And I'm like, not really. And he's like, what? He's like, man, it's me, you, and him playing golf. I'm like, yeah, bro. I'm like, I, 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 I don't really care. My wife says, oh, you're going. So, of course, I got on the plane, flew up there, and we played golf together. And, dude, he was so unbelievably pleasant. Hmm. Uh, it was so hot. It was in his club in New York. And um, it was so hot. I said, look, after about five rounds, I'm like, I'm done if you're done. I said, you don't, you don't, need, to, you don't need to keep doing this. This is so, so damn hot. I said, why don't we just go in there and eat lunch for about 10 minutes, you know, and get you out of here. And he's like, okay. We went in. He spent an hour and a half with me. Fascinating. Hmm. Fascinating. This is just, uh, what? When, when was this, Johnny? Three years ago? He was fascinated. Hey, tell me about your business. How do you get all these people to your conferences? Uh, what's your real estate like? What's your best business? Like the guy just asked questions. I said, Hey, I, I thought he's going to spend 10 minutes with us. He spent an hour and a half shooting the shit. He's like, look, if okay. you ever want me to, if you ever want me to speak at one of your deals, just let me know. Huh. So I said, I'd so, love for you to. So you cashed that in. <laughs> so he showed up okay. at a diplomat hotel and we surprised the audience. Did you have to pay him a large appearance fee or no? Well, you know, we worked it out. Let me just you say that. We worked it out. We worked okay. it out. Okay. And, and number two, <laughs> he did not ask me one question about what I was going to ask him. Okay. He didn't care. He's like, let's just go shoot the shit. Okay. Uh, that's, that's Trump for you. And I can't say that about all celebrities, by the way. Okay. Well, you had a tweet. You said, uh, I'll bet anyone here $100 Michelle Obama runs for president in 2024. Yeah. I'll take that bet. Let's go. I'll 10x that bet. You, well, will you want to give me some odds? Odds? No, no. I mean, dude, not I, odds, but, but I'll, I'll bet you a thousand that no, she's I'll bet not you a hundred straight up. If you want to go more than that, you got to give me some odds because I'm picking okay. some bullshit out of nowhere. Uh, okay. So I'll, we'll just do the hundred. I'm not going to do odds. Okay. We'll, we'll do, we'll do the straight hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. Full disclosure. I know someone that just went to her book reading uh, the other night. 
and they asked her if she's running for president. She said, I absolutely have no interest whatsoever. They to run all for say that shit, bro. Are you kidding me? They all say that. Michelle Obama is running the same playbook her husband did. She has taken every single step that he took before he ran. And before he ran, he says, no way I'll run. He did say that. You're right. Because okay. that's why Hillary Clinton endorsed him originally, because he yeah. said that he won't compete against her, which he, he ultimately did. They and all won. say that bullshit. They're all liars. Okay. They're liars in the beginning. They're liars in the middle. And they're liars at the end. Okay. That's a good point. All right. But I'll still bet $100 on that. Yeah, let's know? go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Let's talk about the other big guests. Tom Brady. Fucking amazing, bro. <laughs> now, it wasn't my idea to bring Tom on, okay? My guy Jared said, let's bring Tom on. I'm like, bro, I don't think that interview is going to be any good, okay? Tom Brady, that interview I did with him was the best, one of the best 45-minute interviews I've ever done in my whole life. Guy's so intense, it's sick. Me and him were like, it was like two freaking alphas just met each other, and we were locked in on each other. Like, I literally thought about flipping to the other side. I was so attracted to the alpha coming off this cat. I'm like, fuck it. If I, if I ever, ever going to go full on, <laughs> it's right Wait, now, right flipping here. To, flipping to the other side, does that mean what I think it means? Yes, it does. Dude, the energy, <laughs> it was so powerful. It was so much magnetism going on. There was so much intensity. There was so much admiration going back and forth for two guys that like, you know, take the whole game of winning seriously. It, it was just, it was so compelling. If you get to see the interview or your audience gets to see it, it's, it's amazing. Okay. So you would go gay for Tom Brady. That's what you're saying, right? Now. I'm just saying, dude, the intensity <laughs> was so freaking crazy. Okay. Uh, Floyd Mayweather. Floyd was phenomenal, man. So the deal with Floyd, I'll tell you, when we bought, we brought Floyd to the Mandalay, um, Bay Hotel. Convention center and we had 12,400, 400 people in the room. Uh, and I'm like, how do I bring Floyd in? Dude, Floyd's been in every arena in the world. How do I bring Floyd in and hit him so hard that he's like, shit, man, this is amazing. So how do you do that when a guy, I mean, all these people that you're bringing up, they've been in every freaking room in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we figured out how to do, you know, in our 10X growth conference, the number one person I'm trying to impress in that room is not the audience that bought the tickets. It's the guy coming in for me to interview. Because if he has a moment, that means everybody else has one. And so Floyd was phenomenal. I brought him in. If you could see the opening, we, we just kept hitting him with like over and over again with acknowledgement until Floyd was like, okay, bro, I'm impressed. Shaquille O'Neal. Yep. Fantastic. Is, you know, I, me and Shaq, we Big talk sometimes. Right there. You know, we, you know, me and him text each other sometimes. Me and him really go back far, you know, pretty far before Vlad TV. And I remember when I met Shaq, to this day, that was the biggest human being I've, I've ever st stood next to. Yeah. He's just obscenely huge because he's not usually when you see these basketball players that are seven footers or whatever, they're usually really tall, lanky. No, he's he's seven feet and and bulky and huge. Yeah. He almost like in medieval times, he'd be the town giant that lived under a bridge somewhere. Massive. You know, I say, people would just think he was he wasn't a human being. Yeah. Magic Johnson, man. Another big dude. Mm. Do you speak at your conference? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. I've done, I've done magic. Who do you got on the list? I've done Usher. Usher was like. Usher, Usher was an interesting one. I actually watched that interview. And uh, I remember when Usher was thinking about doing it, he talked to, uh, I forgot who it was. And, and they were like, yeah, make sure you get your money right though. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that story. <laughs> no, no. That was actually, no, no. He was, he was telling the story uh, on stage with you. And you were like, you know, cause he was, he was checking on you. With some friends, he was like, "Oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you should go ahead and do it. Just make sure you got your money." And you're like, "Oh yeah, get the get your money from that white boy." Oh, okay, okay. I didn't. You, I didn't, you guys just you guys just playing around with. Oh, it. Got, okay, got it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just a little lighthearted. Well, I just tell you a story about Usher. Okay, now Usher's okay. done. I don't know. I said, "Hey, man, behind the stage, I said, how many how many gigs have you done?" He's like, "Grant, I, I mean, I don't even know anymore." In the in the tens of thousands. Sometimes right. he's doing the Super Bowl this year. Sometimes two or three a day. 
that, that, that those guys will do. They'll bounce from one club to the next club, particularly on the come up, right? So I did Usher. I could tell he hadn't done a lot of research on me. They, you know, we made him an offer. He took it. He comes. It's another gig. Like this is what the audience doesn't know. This is just another gig for most of these guys, right? So I'm trying right. to get him to have a moment. So they have a moment. Two years after I did Usher, that interview, I was at a Dave Chappelle concert. Tiffany Haddish invited me. I show up. Tiffany made me wait outside. So she said, I want you to feel like what we feel like when we got to wait. So she made me wait outside. <laughs> and it's a true story. So we, uh, we finally come in. Tiffany grabs me. We're coming in. Dave Chappelle's bodyguards are super fans of mine. I never met Dave. And I'm, I'm, I love Dave. I'd do anything to have Dave Chappelle at my conference. So I'm going to meet Chappelle. I'm excited about it. And the two bodyguards come and stop me and say, Oh my God, man, Cardone, we love you, man. Okay. And, and they're just going off on me, right? Everybody there, everybody's behind it. Two chains is there and, uh, ushers walking up and, uh, I think like everybody's back there. Usher is what, as I'm going to introduce myself to Chappelle, Usher walks up, grabs me from Chappelle in his little red uh, jacket that he always wears everywhere and says, Cardone, I want you to meet my mom. Like he, he was so after he did the research about who I was and had had that experience with me, he remembered that one of 10,000 events or interviews um, that, that, that gave him a moment and experience. It wasn't just a paycheck or a bag. Mike Tyson, you've done his podcast and he did your conference. Yep. Yep. Man, the Mike's I interviewed, Ty I interviewed Tyson before. Uh, we had a moment where I pissed him off for a second. Mike's amazing, man. Yeah. What, a, what uh, an amazing. I was, I was genuinely scared for about a good good minute. Yeah. Because I, I could see the anger building up in him. And I'm, I was actually in the, in the boxing ring at his gym. And I'm like, my security's not going to make it in time if he lunges at me. <laughs> yeah. But he's... um. I say this because Tyson is the most self-aware person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? He is so honest with himself yes. and he'll say it. I just haven't met anyone like that before. Yeah. He's full of love too, man. God's got a lot of love and a lot of tolerance, but you can, he can flip the switch too. Still today. Oh yeah. You had Kevin Hart on there? Yep. Kevin was the easiest interview I've ever done. Hmm. It was two guys that know how to ad lib. There was no preparation, just easy conversation. We could have done that for three or four hours. Kevin was great. You had Steve Harvey on there? Steve was great. Mm -hmm. Steve, Steve didn't know what he was getting into. We had 35,000 people in Marlin Stadium. Um, he walked out. I introduced him. He reached over. He says, bro, who are you? I said, what you talking about, man? <laughs> Shit. He's like, I have never been in a room this big. It's Super Bowl huh. weekend. How many days are you here for? I said, three. He's like, nobody can do this. They're, these people are here for education. So Steve had a real experience. Steve's one of our clients, by the way, at 10X Health. If you've seen Steve's uh, transformation in the last uh, five months, physically, phenomenal. Hmm. Well, check it out. I would check, yeah, because I just got back from Dubai. I found out that Steve Harvey actually lives out there yeah, mostly. Yeah, I think he lives in uh, Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi? Okay, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, Master P. Fantastic. I've been on a couple of stages with him. Right. Uh, Dana White. Dana. Dana actually came unannounced, heard that we were in Vegas. Uh, this is right before I was going to do Undercover Billionaire. And... Uh, he had a friend named Kerry Kasem and said, Kerry, I heard this Cardone characters in town uh, doing an event. Can I, can I come by? And he came by and introduced myself. I said, why don't you come out and talk to people? And that's the first time I met Dana uh, and, um, and interviewed him right there. He's a fantastic, unbelievable American success story. Absolutely. And good American too, by the way, good Patriot American. The thing about Dana White is Dana White is always going to tell you exactly the way it is. There will be no smudging or fudging or bullshit. And then there's Tillman Fertitta. Tillman 
was, if you guys don't know Tillman Fertitta, you, I should get Tillman on your show sometime. I would love that. Uh, Tillman, I mean, not only does he own Landry's, but he owns the Houston Rockets. Tillman owns 650 restaurants, multiple hotels, the Houston Rockets. He's built six yachts himself. Um, I mean, I asked him, I said, how many times do you think you run, have rung a register at a restaurant? Over a trillion dollars worth of receipts. And he went through COVID, you know, I mean, the kind of risk this guy has taken to create the wealth that he has. He grew up not far from where I grew up. And about the same time, I was 25 years old eating in his restaurants and he's about the same age as I am. So he started the same time I, I did, but he's done like 12 times, uh, had 12 times the success in six yachts more than I have. Well, uh According to Forbes, he's worth $8.4 billion. Yeah, I think and they're they call wrong. The world's richest restaurant tour. I think they're, they're wrong. wrong. Okay, so you think it's more than $8.4 I billion. think the Houston Rockets are worth $4 billion by, the, by itself, and he wouldn't sell it at $4 billion. So, again, mm -hmm. look, net worth, most of the time a person's net worth online is going to lag where it really is. My, my information, nobody's ever going to know what it is because I'm a privately held company. Right. I'm a public person, but I'm privately held. So nobody knows. I'm not going to report to Forbes. I don't, I don't have any obligation to report to them or they don't, they don't know what I'm doing. I mean, right. He's called the world's richest restaurateur. Yeah. Crazy. And I guess what I'm wondering is, for example, you look at a Tillman or for example, you had a Scooter Braun on your show. Yeah. These are not celebrities that do bookings. This is not an usher or yeah. a, um, you know, uh, or a you know a Floyd Mayweather that you know not really a Floyd Mayweather but like an uh, uh, Usher is a great example like look you could book Usher for a show if that show is going to be to a whole bunch of finance people it's kind of the same show but you can't pay Tillman to do something that he doesn't want to do he no. has to want to do it I assume dude Tillman when Tillman came to my event he was so pissed off hmm. he's like man look. No, you got to figure, Tillman don't need money. He's not, you're not going to offer him, here, I'll give you 80 grand and come speak at my deal, or here's 200. Like, he's going to be like, 200, dude, like, what are, what are you talking right. about? Exactly. Okay, so Tillman flies his private jet to Miami, lands, gets in his private helicopter, takes it out to his private yacht, waits for the event to start, and takes the private helicopter off his private yacht to the hotel. Only to be told that he can't land at the hotel, that he's got to go back to the airport, and he's fucking violently pissed off. Not not really violently, but he's like, God damn, man, I got all this equipment, I can't use it, and I had to drive all the way across town to get over here. And then he he ingratiated the audience and myself with uh, an hour and 15 minutes of just bomb after bomb after bomb of intelligence that you would never get in four years of college. Well, when you look at all the guests that you booked for your conferences, and I'm not asking for a dollar amount, yeah. but who cost you the most? Who did you have to pay the most to show up? I don't know. I mean, it's, that, it's not even something I, I, I don't even handle that part of it. Yeah, but you're aware of it. You know, I, I know who I want to get. Okay. And, and I'd pay almost anything to have. And that is? Well, Dave Chappelle, number one. Okay. Two, I've been trying to get Tom Cruise for like four years. He's a Scientologist. You can't just kind of call up the, you yeah, know, the yeah, network. Yeah, and have yeah him come but that's in. not, that's not, I would never pull that card, right? So, so, okay. uh, you know, Tom's just like, hey, man, it's just not my thing, Grant. I want to make movies, cinematography. I want to be known for the movies I make and entertaining people. He's like, it's just not my deal. You know, he's like, you know, anyway, I, I but I'm not going to quit on him, right? So, um, he, he, he always had the, has the right to change his mind. So, um, who else have I wanted, Johnny? Uh, Kanye, dude, even through all the Jewish stuff, I wanted Kanye. Like, okay. I would love to sit down with Kanye West. I'm a, ma I'm a, ma I'm a major fan of Kanye West. Right. I mean, you do know that it might go left though, right? Bro. <laughs> Unlike the other guys that show up at your conferences, Kanye does not stick to the script. He will go off script. None of these people, the bro, every person that you mentioned, there's not a person that you mentioned that needs to stay with the script.
Well, Kanye goes off script a little different than the other people it's you mentioned. That's all right. That's all right. But that, that, that's why we live in America, man. Freedom. What, when, okay. when has that been a problem? This, this country was founded on people that fucking broke away from the script. Okay. Yeah, but some of the now, you know I what mean, I heard? I mean, you know what I heard right now? I heard there's a run on tampons right now because this country is making so many pussies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So it's out of control, dude. What's, what's wrong okay. with Kanye having his voice, man? Speaking his mind, fucking up. So what? I fucked up. I've messed up before. We've all messed up. But yeah. if he goes to your conference with 35,000 people and he starts telling you about how you know, Hitler was great. That's my Jews job. My job is to control the conversation. You can't control Kanye's conversation. My job is to control the conversation. I'm a professional. Right. I sold the tickets. Hey, man, I will not, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. If you book Kanye for your conference, I will fly down. I'll be front row seat. I, I will sit there and watch this. Front row, bro. That's 30000 a pop, bro. I, I'll pay 30000 Okay. I'll pay. You, you get Kanye. I will, I will pay a $30,000 ticket and show up. Okay. I'm going to hold you to that. You coming by you, yourself you or you bringing somebody? You can somebody? to it. I got you. You're going to use your <laughs> points? You. You're going to use your points to fly down here first class? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Okay, man. So what's next for you? What's next for me? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to build, we're going to build the largest real estate portfolio in America. Hmm. I'm going to do it without banks. And I'm going to do it without institutions. I'm going to do it with the people. This has never been done before. I'm going to do it at scale. It will be the single largest real estate portfolio in America of multifamily real estate. We're buying real estate right now with no debt, and we do not use money from the institutions. Hmm. So I'm buying a $150 million deal in Chicago right now. It's a glass and steel building, 500 units. I'll pay cash for it in the next uh, 30 days. Hmm. I'm going to back that one up with another deal. It's probably going to be $345 million and pay cash for that. I'm going to raise the money with my friends and followers, my partners, my investors online. And I'm not going to use wealthy families, family offices, institutions, sovereign funds. I'm not kissing the ring of a king. I'm going to do it with the everyday people and the people that, that work with me on this and, and join Cardone Capital. It'll be hundreds of thousands of investors of ordinary people. They get passive income, the depreciation, the capital protection, and the appreciation long term. That's one thing. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to start raising money for small guys, small companies doing, you know, 15 to $25 million that can't access Wall Street. JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs won't give them any attention. So we're going to actually start raising money for those groups and create our own type of marketplace for those companies that are creating. So you're, so you're going to be a bank in a way? I like the way you're thinking now. I mean, that's what it sounds like. I will become a bank in the end. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, that we will we'll offer financial products. In the next 12 months, you'll see us offering financial products, uh, life insurance. Uh, we're rolling out a program for vets right now, completely free, 10X Vets. To provide them mm. with education, not, not two million vets, but 22 million vets, uh, and their families, by the way, uh, free education, how to start a business, how to buy a home, how to get a mortgage. Better than that, how to buy a duplex, a fourplex, eightplex, 16plex. And, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to take this 10X brand and we're going to launch it across our health platforms. Uh, we're working with vets, HVAC, farms and ranches. So I'm going to continue to scale my, my brand out and, and uh, do right by people. Last question. If you look at all the properties that you own, how much acreage is it if you put it all together? Man, I don't know. I've never even considered that. N never considered it. No, it's, the, the it's, why, 12 million, it's 12 million square feet of, of rental property. Is that right? Okay. No, no. It'd be, no, no. hundred and two. It'd be 1.2 billion square feet of real estate. Plus the commercial, plus the office, which is about a half a million. Uh, but I don't know how many acres it is. Okay. Because the reason why I asked is there was an article that I found. And I don't know whether this is something that's even on your radar because it's not really the same type of business. But for example, Bill Gates is known for owning a ton of farmland. Yeah. Right. But China owns way more farmland than he owns. 
And in fact, 17 other countries own more farmland than China. Yeah. So now they're actually trying to pass regulation to prevent China and other countries from buying farmland. Essentially, you know, what people are scared of, you know, buying up our country. I don't really believe that, but whatever. Yeah. Um, are you aware of this happening? And is this a concern at all? Because I know you don't own any farmland, right? Yeah, I don't own any farmland. No, I don't. I wouldn't mind right. having some farmland, but I don't own any. I wouldn't own it for an investment. I'd own it okay. because I want to farm land. Because I, I, right. I do like to till in the soil. Probably didn't know that about me. But if I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now, I'd have a damn nursery. Okay. Um, but on the China thing, you guys need to quit worrying about China. China's got their hands full. For every problem America's got, China's got fucking one billion problems more than we have. Okay? They got oh, yeah. more debt than we have. Okay? They have an aging population that is, you know, probably eight times bigger than ours is. Aging, just the aging part of the population. Okay, they have debt problems that are that 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 are beyond monster issues. They have a middle class that will collapse on itself, and they have a real estate problem that makes they have more vacant real estate in their country than we have in totality. Oh yeah, no, you've seen those huge like those huge buildings that are totally empty, entire yeah. cities and towns that yeah. are literally nothing there. Yeah. And, and, and any of you out there that think that they're going to become a, the overwhelming power in the world and that Russia and China are going to join up and the U.S. dollar is going to go away, you do not understand how many U.S. dollars there are. The U.S. dollar will not fail. You will be trading the U.S. dollar. There will be many, many dollars that, that, that fail before the U.S. dollar trade uh, uh, fails. I mean, just the black money on this planet, black market money on this planet, most of that is traded in U.S. dollars. Who? What do you want, Portuguese dollars? You want rubles? Right. It's crazy. And the right. whole thing I mean, that Kiyosaki says about gold, the next time you have him, ask him, bro, how, do, how could you get rid of $10 million worth of gold in 24 hours if you wanted? You can't. Yeah, I'm not sure. You I'm can't. Not sure. I, don't, I don't own no, any no, gold. No, you can't you know I mean? get rid of it. You cannot yeah. get rid of $10 million in one day. First of mm. all, it would have to be authenticated, sent to a group that has to study it and make sure it is exactly what you said it was. It would take mm -hmm. probably a month to get rid of that much gold. So this whole thing about I'm going to keep gold, 65 years old, you're 50 years old, 115 years. Is it, have you ever had anybody offer you a piece of gold for anything? No. Never, bro. Never. It's bullshit. You got to go dig it up to get it. Then you got to go dig a hole to save it. It right. doesn't pay you while you wait. You can't right. use it when you need it. And how are you going right. to carry around two pounds with you everywhere you go? Uh, yeah, I never thought gold was a very good investment because it just sits there. Bang, and bang, it bang. only goes up if someone else is willing to pay more than what you paid for. Bang. That's it. Yeah, but it's yeah. a great headline. I'm buying gold. The world's going to hell. Okay. Yeah, the, no, the whole I world's going to collapse. In be in gold. Be in silver. Oh yeah. No. Listen. I, I remember Warren Buffett. He he broke it down. He basically said, you know, if you buy, let's just say you buy a farm, every day that farm is making money. Yes. It's generating income. You buy a piece of gold. It just sits there, and you got to pay. You got to put in Fort Knox and pay security guards to to make sure no one steals it. And you're just hoping in the future it'll be worth more than what it is today, but it doesn't generate anything. Yeah. What people need today you know, is you're passive income. You're better off with a farm than a block of gold. Exactly. That, what people need today is passive income. People need to be focused on not, before you get wealth, don't worry about wealth creation, worry about passive income, not earned income. Get your earned income. Second thing is you need passive income. Income that you get paid, I'm talking to your audience now, whether you work mm -hmm. or don't work, whether you go to work, don't work, sick or not sick, whether there's a COVID or not a COVID, a war or not a war, you still get paid every month. That is the only true money on this planet is money. Right. Whether you're dead or alive, you get income every month. Even the retiring people out there, the, the 75 million people that are going to move into retirement in the next 15 years, do you guys need income? You do not need money. You need cash mm -hmm. flow, not cash. Right. I mean, for me, it's my YouTube channel and, and my, you know, my content portfolio. Yeah. Like during this conversation, I've made thousands of dollars off my old videos. How much are you going to make off of me, man? Uh, I don't know. I got to calculate it. How much you think this, how, how much of a hoe have I been for you today? Uh, I mean, 
it's not going to be a hundred thousand or even fifty thousand or anything else. Like, like, it'll probably be a few, a few, a few thousand dollars profit if we, you know, once we, you know, calculate you, the cost. So you think you're gonna make like two thousand dollars off of me? A few thousand? Yeah, I would say about that. So what's it feel like for Grant Cardone to be your hoe? <laughs> you are not a hoe <laughs> on any stretch of the imagination, because what you're doing on here is you know, introducing you to a, to a segment of, of my fan base. And I have, I think you have two and a half million subscribers on your YouTube channel. I have 5 million. Yeah. You know, and especially with well, you, I it sure actually would like some well of those because, 5 million to come over, man, and subscribe to my channel. Right. Well, especially for you, you have a different kind of business for you. Like, you know, you sell high, high ticket items, right? No, 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 of, that's not true. 80%, 80% of what we do. Um, I don't ever get any money from. We had 160,000 transactions last year that paid me money, but we had 700,000 transactions that got a product for free first. Okay, fair enough. But I'm saying that whatever customers end up buying your products. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, chances are over the long term, you'll probably make more off this interview than me. That's my guess. Well, I just like, you know, I'd if like not, some of those if five. Not, it'll be relatively close. You some know of those I'm saying? five million. Either. Yeah. Neither one of us is hoeing for the other person. I got is what it, I'm man. Saying. But I, I was just going to say, I'd love for some of your 5 million subscribers to come over and subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I'll provide them with education for free. They never have to buy anything from me. You should. Yeah, it's Grant Cardone. I, there you I, go. I, I came go up with you. something really creative. I said, shit, man, what should I call my Instagram channel? Grant Cardone. What should I call my YouTube channel? Let's go with Grant Cardone. Twitter, Grant Cardone. <laughs> yep. That's what it is, Grant. It's always a pleasure, man. Appreciate always a pleasure you, man. When we sit down. Look, a lot of love to your audience too, guys. Uh, uh, I'm pulling for everybody out there, man. These crazy times that we're going through right now. While the world goes crazy, stay focused on your family. Stay focused on your mission. Stay focused on your purpose and take care of the people you love. Vlad, thank you, man. Thank you as well. Until okay. next time. Send me that Peace. $100, by the way. <laughs> that $100? No, you're going to owe me $100 to Michelle Obama. She's going to run, bro. We'll I guarantee you. All right, we'll see. Okay. We'll see. I Peace. mean, it's on record now. You don't try to ditch your way out of it because you know. I won't. I'm gonna set that hundred aside right now. All right, man. Okay. Take care. Peace. Peace. <laughs>